You may have heard former Supreme Court Judge Jonathan Sumption say he thinks Lucy Letby is probably innocent. And the case that an injustice has occurred here is really quite strong. Do I think that there should be a retrial? Yes, of course I do. So the legal establishment seems to be increasingly receptive to Lucy Letby being exonerated. I say legal establishment. This could sound conspiratorial. Generally, I think of establishment think as a reluctance of one judge to criticise another. At some of Lucy Letby's appeal hearings so far, the judges have been very friendly towards each other. But his experience as a criminal judge is unrivaled. It follows that his judgment must be afforded very considerable respect. That was the second three-judge leave to appeal hearing. The flattery amongst judges was more apparent at the first. With that being said, though Lord Sumption has said Lucy Letby is probably innocent, the question is, are there any legal grounds which can trigger an appeal? The answer to that is yes, due to an increasing number of disclosure issues, the most notable of which involves Dr Ravi Jairam, but also because of a legal precedent that was created with the exoneration of Angela Cannings in 2003. For those that don't know the case of Angela Cannings, she was a mother who was wrongly convicted for the murder of two of her sons. A key factor in the overturning of the conviction was new research published after the trial, which could not have reasonably been expected to be put before the jury at the time of the trial. In the case of Angela Cannings, this research concerned sudden infant death syndrome. In the case of Lucy Letby, there has been new research during and after the trial on the subject of insulin immunoassay tests. So I have to say, I am not a legal expert, though I am interested to hear from anyone who may have legal training. The one thing that I do know is that having accepted a reason for a determination in one case, an equal level court is obligated to act if very similar circumstances occur in a very similar future case. So to pick out some lines from the Angela Cannings Court of Appeal decision, which will also apply to the Lucy Letby case, quote, in addition to the concerns already noted about an excessively dogmatic approach, we must immediately note a substantial body of research, not before the jury and received by us in evidence, suggesting that such deaths can and do occur naturally, even when they are unexplained, Another important line from the Court of Appeal decision, which can be found linked in the description, is this, quote, We have received significant and persuasive fresh evidence, which was not before the jury, some of it the result of further research or research published post-trial, close quote. So you may have guessed I'm going to point out the existence of research published post-trial, which contradict the statements made in court something which I think was incredibly damaging to Lucy Letby's defence case was how dogmatic the prosecution expert witnesses were in court. Ironically, I think this could be highly beneficial to her appeal. In one case, the prosecutor puts it to Peter Hindmarsh, an expert witness on the insulin cases, quote, we're going to look at the administration of insulin if that is what happened. He mentions that as a reference to the arguments that the defence were making. The prosecutor then says, quote, Is there any question in these circumstances that that is what happened? Close quote. As in, is there any doubt about insulin administration? Professor Hindmarsh responds, I think we can be quite certain that at that time the exogenous insulin was present. In another example, of how categoric the claims in court were, the prosecutor puts it to Dr Gibbs, quote, was such a blood glucose reading expected or unexpected, close quote. As part of his response, Dr Gibbs says, quote, of course, we did not know at this time it was because he'd had a large dose of insulin inside him, close quote. So next, to look at some of the research that has come out in the last couple of years since the start of the first Lucy Letby trial, which in my opinion make a trial environment where a potential insulin poisoning is discussed as an openly acknowledged 
and indisputable fact look farcical this piece of landmark research titled Insulin Immunoassay Interference Due to Human Anti-Mouse Antibodies in a Patient with Ketotic Hypoglycemia. The significance of this piece of research may take a bit of getting your head around if you don't have a science background, but I think it is possible. Reading through the study, they acknowledge the general issue of antibody interference in immunoassays for other hormones. Then focusing on this part highlighted in red, quote, to our knowledge, insulin assay interference has not been previously reported, end quote. Looking at the date this study was published, it was published on the 23rd of March, 2023, in the Journal of Clinical Endocrinology and Metabolism. This is significant because the Lucy Letby trial started in October 2022, five months before this study was published. I'm not sure if this research by itself will be enough to trigger a reopening of the case. It may be significant that it came out in the middle of the trial as opposed to after it. However, there are arguments that the defence may have been too preoccupied by the trial to notice its publication. It's also not the only study that the defence can cite. I'm going to focus on this study for a couple of minutes as it provides an explanation for why there might have been such an insulin result as there was in the Lucy Letby case. So to understand why anti-mouse antibodies are so significant, you need to know a bit about how immunoassays are developed. If you take a sample of human insulin and inject it into a mouse, then the mouse is going to develop an immune response to this foreign protein. This gives human scientists an opportunity to capitalize on nature as the antibodies the mouse will produce will have a very high degree of binding specificity towards human insulin. The next part might be offensive to animal rights advocates, but if scientists then remove the spleen of the mice and then carry out several other steps, they can get to the stage where they can mass produce these antibodies which bind to human insulin, which will be known as monoclonal antibodies. So once you have the monoclonal antibodies, which will bind to the protein you're looking to assess, you can go ahead and run the immunoassay. The immunoassay will lead to the formation of sandwiches. So in this study, which showed mouse antibody interference, you would expect what you could call the successfully formed sandwiches to look like this. You have the two mouse antibodies sandwiching the insulin. An enzyme, symbolized here as a red star, is added to the top antibody, which is useful for purposes of identification and counting. However, in the blood sample this individual provided for the immunoassay, they also had human anti-mouse antibodies, which will bind to the mouse detection antibodies and throw a spanner in the works. From this graphic, you can see roughly how the sandwiches are supposed to be formed but the human antibody response to the mouse antibody response creates a problem. To detect this antibody interference, the study authors run another technique called liquid chromatography mass spectrometry, which is more specific and will assess insulin and human anti-mouse antibodies on an individual level, not as sandwiches. Looking here at table two from the results, the second and third column show the level of insulin as recorded by the immunoassay second column and LCMS or liquid chromatography mass spectrometry in the third column. Looking at the first row for instance, they have insulin recorded at 334.05 picomoles per liter when assessed by immunoassay. Meanwhile, they have a slash under the liquid chromatography mass spectrometry heading, which presumably is to signify a zero value. In every subsequent row, insulin is far higher by immunoassay compared to liquid chromatography mass spectrometry. So remember, in the test for which Lucy Letby was convicted, they didn't do this follow-up technique, and it may have been the case they would have found insulin undetectable 
if they did the follow-up technique. As I've said though, the new evidence goes beyond the study on anti-mouse antibodies. Reading through a summary of the new insulin reports written by Lucy Letby's new defense experts, quote, new evidence has been published which increases our awareness and understanding about hyperinsulinism in the neonatal period. This information has provided greater insight into how adverse perinatal factors can cause hyperinsulinism in some newborn and premature infants. This is termed perinatal stress-induced hyperinsulinism, PSIHI. A second line that I'd like to pick out says, quote, there is now evidence that shows that the presence of antibodies, IAA, insulin autoantibodies, and other antibodies such as HAMA, human anti-mouse antibodies, can interfere with the immunoassay result and cause falsely high insulin results. Further details about the new evidence which is going to be brought can be found in this open letter by Dr. Adele Ishmael, which was sent to prosecution expert witness Peter Hindmarsh, quote, recent studies and FDA submissions have clearly shown that the Roche Alexis immunoassay, the same as the one used in this case, can and have produced multiple falsely elevated insulin readings. As mentioned, in the Angela Canning's judgment, they considered research papers awaiting publication. So in conclusion, in my opinion, the view that was put to the jury that intentional insulin poisoning is the only explanation for blood results that made up part of the trial is clearly unsustainable. Furthermore, having accepted the premise that new research constitutes new evidence in the Angela Canning's case, I don't see how the Court of Appeal can realistically decline that proposition in the Lucy Letby case without the appropriation of the law looking arbitrary and inconsistent. I am doubtful that the Appeal Court will decline this new evidence, and I think it's probable at some point down the line there will either be a retrial or the original convictions will be quashed.